Amen, amen. Go ahead and grab a seat. Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Kristen Friend turning her back on you, but uh, now she's just doing all the labor for me, as usual. Um, hey, so uh, a little context. So I, most of you guys know me. I'm Jason, lead pastor here at Rise. And uh, hey, good to see you. And, uh, and this is Kristen. And uh, so Kristen stepped into last year or the year before a role that is executive director of ministries. And so we just worked super closely together in like a lot of my role is around, okay, vision, direction, where are we going, teaching, preaching, you know, those kind of things. And then Kristen is kind of, okay, if I'm like, hey, this is where we're going, Kristen's like, okay, and here's how we get there, right? You know, and you know, the operations, the details. We just, but we work closely together with staff and, you know, our executive ministry team and, you know, all those different areas and stuff like that. And so um, I wanted to take a moment as this is kind of the beginning of the year, even though January is always 57 days long for some reason, you know, we're now in February, um, but to stop and look back and then to look forward. Um, one of my favorite exercises to do with our teams is we reflect on the last year and we just say, hey, what did God do this last year? And it's always amazing just like how many things and moments um, just get shared. And so um, I just, as we gather for a, a team night, I just want to take a moment and reflect on like what God did last year, um, the, the ways that he moved. And, and even for you, as we're talking about these things, I want there to be things that you're even thinking about. Man, this, this is what I saw last year. This is what God did. We're, we're just going to highlight a few that I think are worthy of highlighting um, because they're, um, they're just a huge joy in, 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 in that. And then we're going to talk about, hey, as we are coming into this new year, here's some things that we're, um, we're excited about that we're building towards and that we're, that we're looking forward to. So re reflecting back, um, 2023 is the year that, that Paz Coffee opened. Do you ever just walk in that space and be like, what is this, right? Just the beauty of that space. Um, up in the corner here, um, that is a picture, uh, like an initial drawing that my wife did, Jess, my wife Jessie did, in 2018. Because when we got this building, we knew from day one, we want the front corner of this space, the primary real estate of this property, to be open to the outside. Like we wanted it to be like a gateway drug to church. You know, I don't know if you can say that. I won't say that on a Sunday, but it's Monday. So, uh, you know, and so it, for our community and what that looks like. And, and it is, here's what I want to just touch on on this is I truly believe that Pause Coffee, it's not just a coffee shop. It's, it's a reflection of our church that, that people from our city get to walk in and experience some of the beauty and creativity of people like Kim and Will Ray, like uh, the vision that they had of what this space could look like. People walk in and they see those, those rows of seats made out of giant, bigger, you know, you can't even, I'm like, can you buy that at Home Depot? I don't think you can, you know, I, I, maybe Lowe's, but I don't, I don't know. Like that's, but that's like Jason Fellman in his artistic brilliance, being able to create those stairs and those, you know, th those seats and to, you know, to, to walk into a space or to see the counter that Russ Moss handcrafted in those seats that he handcrafted. And, you know, even like so many people, guys like Kevin Kelly, who just, he was like, I will do the, I, when I get off work, I'll show up at pause and I'll do the drywall. Like you walk upstairs and, you know, Tommy Elrod helped lay those floors. So when you see those gaps, you know who to blame. Like, <laughs> but, 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 he, but here's my point. Okay. Here, here, here's my point. That space is a reflection of our church. And it's, it, it's a space of, of, not just the creative beauty, because I do think churches have a responsibility to bring beauty to a city. Um, I would hope our city is more beautiful because we believe the gospel, that, that, that Jesus is restoring things. Um, but also, it's a, it's a reflection of a of place for community, a place for discipleship, a place for uh, reminiscing and connection. And so I, I just think it's important to reflect on man, that happened uh, this year and, and just celebrate the beauty of it. Yeah, and I think one thing that's important to know is that 
that was in the inception of the building. We wanted a coffee shop there, and so many people came to us and said, could I put this in here? And they'd be really great things, really good causes that could have had you know, a good impact on our city, but God gave us a very specific vision. He wanted a coffee shop there, not anything else. And so we had to say very kindly, like, no, I'm sorry, we have something else in mind. Even though we didn't know, we didn't know that Will and Kim would um, want to do this. And the day that we did, it was like vision fulfilled. God was faithful to give us a vision, and we had to be faithful in holding on to that vision until he said, it's time. It's time to build it. Now is the right time. And now when you walk in, you see people from all different walks of life, all different faith backgrounds, all in Gresham coming into our church building. This building is covered in prayer. It is because of the church that we get to see this kind of impact. And so I'm just really grateful. I'm grateful to Will and Kim for being um, courageous and bold and being willing to step out in the midst of um, a city that maybe would be hard to open a brand new coffee shop and just um, so glad to see it flourish. Yeah. Uh, the second thing that I want to just focus, oh yeah, we're, we're a clapping church. Yeah. Where's this on Sunday, y'all? Come on, man. Uh, yeah, apparently. All right. Um, it's Kristen. Nice. Thank you. I appreciate just that. Just Nolan and Kristen and Stacy and get all I'm the claps. I'm not moving to Arizona. It's okay. <laughs> not today. No. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. All right. All right. The second is uh, Kingdom Builders. And, and in particular, can you talk a little bit about like cl the clarity we got around that and why that's important. Yeah, so Kingdom Builders is an initiative that we've had for a long time. You've probably glanced at it. When we say it, you're like, what is that thing? I think I've seen something. As you go back by the bathrooms, there's the this Kingdom Builders wall, and it's talking about our local partnerships and our world missions and then planting churches in our city and beyond. And this year, we took that vision and we put lots of clarity to it. We built a team around it, people who are generous with their time and generous with their money and want to see the kingdom spread all throughout the world. And they, this has been just an incredible thing. These people have come into a space and we have these funds and we have been um, really just working hard to be faithful stewards of what we've been given. You guys are generous people. You really are. This last year, we gave over $137,000 out of our doors. That's massive. That's really big. And so this team has just been faithful to that. We're taking that money and we're saying, God, where do you want it to go? And then we're sending it out of our doors because we believe that the money that God has given us is his and we should do whatever he wants us to do with it. And so we're really excited to get, the, get that clarity around it, but also local partnerships. We've seen just a massive impact there. Over 4,000 hours last year given by you guys. You guys feed on the ground. I see Mo in the crowd. She has started a team that goes to Good Shepherd one Saturday a month and loves on kiddos whose moms are in recovery. That has been a huge step for us to take a next level partnership with someone in our city. And we're just so grateful. Shepherd's Door is huge for our, our community. It has um, been a faithful partner in the Portland area. And so we're just grateful. We really are. I want you to hear that your dollars make an impact in our city, and they make an impact in the world, and we're, we're just so grateful for your generosity. Yeah, and we want to continue to make that impact. And so, you know, even one of the things I did, not, it wasn't in 2023, but it was the end of the previous, in 2022, is I took a trip to, to India to see one of the partners that we work with that is planting churches all around the world. And, you know, it's one of those organizations that we plant X number of churches and it only costs $400 to plant a church. And if I'm honest, it's one of those, you're like, okay, yeah, that sounds cute. That's great. Like, but that's not we know there's infla there, there's something being made up here, right? You can't plant a church for $400. And then I showed up in India, and one of the first things we did was we watched this graduation of church planters. And there was 400 church planters graduating that day. And I was like, okay, so now they're going to go plant a church. And they're like, no, no, in order to graduate, you have to have already been planting a church for the last two years. These represent churches that have been planted out of this organization over the last two years. And the next day they had another graduation with another 400, okay? And then we went and yeah, it was amazing, right? And so then we went, we are so clappy, I like this. Like, we're, we're gonna be a charismatic church in no time. You know, it's gonna, it's gonna happen, right? We're gonna get some personality, okay? And so we, we literally, and then we went and visited these different 
churches and like you get to meet with people. And so like this picture on the left side that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm taking the picture, so I'm not in it, right? But they would gather in these homes and, and worship together and, and preach the gospel. And these are not, no one there grew up in church, right? They grew up in different religions. And so seeing that fruitfulness. So this is an organization where we've said, this is a huge impact. We're doubling, you know, even this year, we're doubling our gift, you know, to them and support to them. And then even starting to ask, hey, what does it look like for us to start preparing for things like short-term mission trips for our youth and young adults? Because we want to have a heart for the world. And, and what God is doing here, he's doing um, on an exponential scale all over the world. We, and we want to be a part of it. And so that's a huge thing. Third, third thing um, that we're really um, just reflecting backwards on and just excited about, you know, honestly, the, the phrase is just bigger impact. And, and what I mean by that is when you plant a church, you kind of just like, I hope people show up, <laughs> you know, like you're like, is this going to work? And because the truth is, statistically, most church plants fail. And in Portland in particular, when, when I meet with other church planters kind of all around the nation and they ask where I'm from and I say Portland, they're like, oh yeah, that's where church plants go to die. I've literally talked to denominations that like we cannot get a church plant to stick. And yet what's happening here at Rise is it's really incredible to see the level of impact, um, the, the growth that is taking place. You know, Christmas Eve this last year, um, we had just under 1,700 people <laughs> come for Christmas Eve, kids and adults. And, and what's happened in that is that growth is not because of something we're doing. That growth is a movement of the Holy Spirit. Uh, th that growth is, is, is God drawing hungry people to himself. And so uh, from a church leadership standpoint, we just feel like we need to be good stewards of what God has entrusted us with. And we celebrate that. We embrace that. And, and every single one of those numbers, they matter because every single one of those numbers is not a number. They're a name. They're a name with a story. And God is working and redeeming in their lives. Yeah. So this last year, we had 81 baptisms, and that was the most we've ever had in a year. And we're, yeah, it's bit big for us. But it's big for all of us. Some of you are part of that 81. I'm looking out on the crowd. Some of you are part of that 81. Some of you are part of those local partnerships. This is what we're doing. If we want to see Gresham change, we need to baptize more people. And I think that this year, not even setting goals higher, but just saying, God, what do you want to do? What if he wants to baptize 300 here this year? It's just exciting. And then another number that we actually really care about is how many of you all are team members. We had 100 new team members this year. And that means that the more people decide to become contributors here to the mission, the more people that are going out of our doors spreading the gospel, it's just a big deal. And I think it's kind of important for you guys to remember and for me to remember that God said that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The harvest is out there. He's not saying to go pray for the harvest. He tells us to pray for the workers. And so thank you for being here tonight and being part of team night. But also we need to be a church on our knees praying. Gresham needs more workers. And so would you join us in praying for more people to come to be part of this and then to, to join in and being contributors to what God is doing in this city? Yeah. Do you guys have a good year in 2023? It's, it's encouraging to reflect on those things, okay? Um, kind of switching to looking forward and what that looks like. Uh, just kind of three things feeling excited about looking forward. Uh, the first, um, we turned 10 years old. We, we have the 10 years of rise. Like that, there, there's a level of that that is just, it, it's really encouraging. And, and in particular for me, as we come upon this 10th year, I just spend a lot of time both reflecting back and looking forward to what God is doing, because I really do believe that this is just the beginning. Um, but one of the things that I really feel a lot of clarity around this year, uh, as we enter this 10th year, I just feel a lot more um, clarity around our identity. Now, this is who um, we are. We, you, you start to really establish who we are. And so one of the things that we're gonna do at our 10 year anniversary in the following weeks, um, you know, there's three Sundays after that and then Easter, which we just realized we have to add a fourth service for Easter, which is fun. Um, and, uh, but we, we're gonna be sharing, this is what rises kind of 
communal church culture is. And, and we get these booklets printed. We've been working on this for about, you know, probably about six, seven months now. And I just want to read a snippet for you because I think it gives a glimpse of these, these are the kind of cultural values. And, and when I say our values and, and who we are, this is not like, hey, here's what we're aspiring to do. After 10 years, it's like, no, this is who we are and this is what we're all about. And we do not compromise in these things, okay? This is what God has shaped. So, so let, me just, let me just give you one, a, a snippet of it, okay? Uh, and, and I think you'll resonate with this. We are always only fully, clearly all about Jesus. This is our identity. Let me, let me read this to you. Jesus is why we are here. Jesus is why we exist. Jesus is why we serve. Jesus is why we gather. Jesus is why we sing. Jesus is why we love. Jesus is why we preach. Jesus is our why. He is unrivaled, unmatched, and unchanging. He is God, he is good, and he is glorious. He is the only one who could ever save, the only one with power to raise the dead to life, the only one that's worth surrendering your life to. So we will be uncompromisingly all about Jesus. Our goal is not to get people to church. Our goal is to get people to Jesus. Because if people can meet Jesus, they will see that Jesus is better. Like that's our North Star, is it not? And so we, we're gonna unfold these values that we've been spending time working, crafting, saying like, no, this is who we are as a church and we are pressing harder than ever into that identity that God has named us and shaped and formed us because we feel more confident than ever in what God is doing in, in this church. So um, I, I, I know I skipped over you and stole a little of your thunder. So uh, tenure, what are you excited about? I'm just very excited for it. No, um, <laughs> If that doesn't fire you up, right, Jesus, it's all about him and what he is doing. And I just hope that you guys all know that this is our party. This is our 10-year anniversary. Whether you came into the church a year ago or six months ago or 10 years ago, we are celebrating. And so would you join us in growing that excitement? I feel like it's my kid's birthday party in some way and that I am just ready to throw it. And I think it's going to be a blast. But the the baptisms and everything that we do, it's all for God's glory. So just get excited for it. Okay, next thing that we're going to be unfolding in the handful of uh, the coming months is something we've, uh, we're, we're calling it real life discipleship. And, and, and here, here's what I mean by that. Like, um, we want to be followers of Jesus in the everyday things of life, all of life, okay? And um, one of the areas that we feel that we need to grow in as a church is to provide those kind of resources for the real life areas, okay? I'm talking about things like um, being a disciple as a parent. What is it, how do we do parenting courses for parents that come around, create groups and support and team and, and, and those kind of things? How do we follow Jesus with our finances? And, and I don't mean like, how do we motivate people to give? I'm talking about how do we be good stewards of what God has entrusted us with? It's discipleship, you guys. And, and we as a church, we have a responsibility to say, how can we come around each other and help each other in these ways of, of what that looks like. And so we're gonna be unfolding in the coming months a number of different like, you know, real life discipleship courses that are almost kind of alpha style where we gather here together. You know, maybe we watch something or go through something larger as in a larger group and then break up into small groups in the room for those. And it's gonna be all kinds of different areas that really tap into um, an area where like, hey, I, I'm looking for some growth in this area. Um, you know, even, even I was talking with Chris Cutchell the other day, and he's, he has this fire for, uh, this passion for, I want to do one on who Jesus is for people who are just brand new to church and are like, I want to know more about Christ. How do I give my life to him? What does it look like to, to convert, convert to Christianity and surrender all my life and, and actually walk through those kind of things? And so um, I, I'm feeling really excited about what that would look like. And I think it's going to be a, a pretty foundational um, element of discipleship and growth uh, in our church. Yeah, and one thing I think that we want you to know is that we hear you. You know, we see as a leadership team your prayer requests, and we know that this is real life. And that this is not someone else's job to respond to, but it is the church's job. We should be helping form and create better marriages, better parenting, better financial situations. And so we are just in it with you. We're just real people too. And so we want to see better health all the way across the board. And so real life discipleship and some of these um, different classes and things are going to be pivotal to seeing that grow. And we just hope that you'll, you'll join us in that.
Yeah. Okay. Last thing um, is with kind of seeing this narrative, seeing this growth, seeing all the things that have been happening. Um, we uh, we need to expand our building, and um, I we need to actually expand this facility. Now, here's what's incredible. Um, we bought this building in 2018, renovated in 2019, but part of that was we sectioned off about a third of it to lease out. Now, baseball's out now, uh, and so we have this facility, and we can, exp- we can actually increase our footprint uh, by about 50%. And we have room to expand in this building. We're not having to go look for something else somewhere else. That is huge to be able to have, okay? And so here, here's the key, kind of the key focuses of that. One is we're gonna build a brand new kids area o- over on the far side of this building that will, we, you won't even, it won't interrupt how we're operating on Sundays, okay? So we're gonna be able to build from the ground up multi-level, you know, kids area, including a dedicated youth area, because all these kids are coming up and they need space. You know, we're going to, we're going to have hundreds of kids coming through that are going to be in youth, youth age, no time at all. And so we, we need to put as a church, we need to start preparing space for them. And we want a space where these kids are like, I can't believe they built this for us. I want kids having memories of church where they're like, no, church was, we were not just put in some back corner. Our church did so much to disciple us. This is a, I want kids to walk in that space and be like, I can't believe I get to be here, okay? And so we're putting our money where our mouth is with that. And and that is going to be a huge focus. And then expanding this current auditorium, um, we can add, we can fit about 440 um, on maxed out, right, on a Sunday. And so we're going to sp- expand it out, getting somewhere towards 650, 700 seats um, in here, reorientate the stage, you know, kind of rebuild things in here, um, and also while expanding the lobby. And so it's going to be kind of a tiered system that we're going to be sharing the vision for and what that looks like in the coming months, uh, especially a lot later this year. But I... I am just excited about the process. I'm excited about how it's going to rally our church together. Um, l- let, me just, let me just do something um, r- real quick. Um, raise your hand if you were a part of the, the initial building process of this building, okay? Yeah. So that, that's about 25 to 30% of this room. That, that's kind of where our stats are. About 75% of our church um, has come to this church after that initial building, okay, campaign, uh, build out, all that stuff. It was one of the most exciting, unifying things we've ever been a part of. It is so fun to just be like, no, we are doing this together. And so we want to invite our entire church um, to be a part of that. And, and I'm just excited that we have, we have the space to expand, you know, in that kind of way. Yeah, he's pretty fired. I am. Um, I think the other thing. You don't have to mute her yet. I, I, said, I, I said the signal. This is embarrassing. Oh, back again. No, yes. It doesn't really matter. Um, I think the thing that is important to know is that this was our church building this church. This was people like Jason Fellman who took him and his team. They took a year to build this place. And we did the absolute best with the ability that we had. And now we're going to do as much as we possibly can to fill this building in all of its capabilities. It's going to be fantastic. And I am confident after talking with architects and meeting with teams, we're going to have an experience for kids that's unlike anything else. And people are going to come in here and experience the Holy Spirit's divine creativity in this place. And this is going to change Gresham because kids are going to come in here and love being here. And if that isn't exciting, I don't know what is. And we'll redo the parking lot too. Sorry. <laughs> Whoa! Let's go! Let's go! Oh, man. Oh, my gosh. Everybody's like, we need a four wheel drive car. We're going to church. <laughs> you guys excited for what God's doing? Yeah. I didn't know the parking lot thing was going to be such a hit. <clears throat> Will you guys pray with me, Lord? We just want to follow you, we just want to honor you. We just want to make you famous in this city. Would, would you be glorified through the way we worship? Would you be glorified through the way we build? Would you be glorified through the way we preach? Would we just be your vessels? Do whatever with this church that you want to do. 
We're saying, send us, use us. We are in surrender to you. We want to be faithful to what you've entrusted us with. And we pray all this in your name. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. Then he went on a journey. Immediately the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way the man with two earned two more. But the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents, and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I've earned two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Master, I know you. You're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, You evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers, and I would have received my money back with interest when I returned. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Hello. I'm excited to be here with you guys. And you know it is a female up here when the first thing she sits down is her Stanley pink water bottle. So... If you don't know what a Stanley is, it's okay. It's an overpriced water bottle. Um, I'm really excited to be here tonight. I love team nights because I feel like it's just an opportunity to be with family. We're brothers and sisters. We're serving together. And I feel, even if we don't talk about it, it's just this unspoken truth that we feel seen in some of the hardships of ministry sometimes. Um, sometimes, to be honest, we're just in the thick of it. And we know that ministry can be hard. People can be hard. Um, leading can be hard, teams can be hard, all of those things. And so we kind of get to share that common ground today, but we also get to experience the beauty of ministry, the miracles that happen in ministry, um, and just be reminded of the unity that we have as a church and as a body. Um, and I'm gonna guess if you're in here and you're someone that serves on a team or you're interested in serving on a team, I'm gonna guess that you're potentially somewhat of a doer. Are there any doers, achievers, people with checklists? Yes. And this has been me probably since I could write. I loved my planner so much. It's like if I lost it, it would not be, it would not be good for anyone. And if you're anything like me, you like to be a part of things. You don't wanna miss out. Um, you're excited to see the mission moved forward, whatever that might be, in work or at home, um, and you wanna check things off the list sometimes, which can be good and bad. I, in my checklist that I write each day, I will sometimes even write a box and put shower because I truly just wanna check the box, and sometimes I need a reminder to shower. Sorry, Chris, okay. Um, but to give a little context to who I am and some of that doing, um, 
10 years ago almost, uh, Chris and I got the privilege of planting rise with Jason and Jesse, my parents, and some other couples and families. Um, we were just excited to plant um, a church here in the Gresham area and have another expression of the church. Um, and a couple years prior to that, we opened a coffee shop in Fairview. Six years later, did a drive through around the corner, and still, still, we're still doing that, um, doing the coffee thing. And amidst the last decade, we've also had three boys. If you're wondering what a life with three boys plus a husband plus two geckos and a cat that are also male is like, it's just very loud. It's exactly what you would picture. It's very fun. Um, basketball is being played 24-7. Pokemon cards are everywhere, and I try to throw them away as much as possible. Um, but it's been busy, and I like to have a full schedule, and I like to have mission and goals and dreams and ambition, and I do believe God has given me those things, and I believe he's probably given you a lot of that as well. Um, but probably the last year and a half, my like most recent blessing in all of that is my son Harbor. He is now three, and I'm realizing that he's not a baby anymore, and it's starting to feel like, is something else gonna come? Like, what's next? What's next on the list? What can I think about and dream about? The diapers are going away, the crib is gone, the binkies, it took a long time, but the binkies are gone, <laughs> and I just started to kind of get that itch and that stirring to do something again. But I think this time it wasn't from maybe the best intentions. It was a little bit more about filling my schedule, filling my cup, um, having something new, because new is fun. And when I really realized it with Harbor, because if you know him, this will not surprise you, and you maybe have already heard it, but not too long ago, I was telling him how much I loved him. I was like, you're my baby, I love you. And he's like, I love you. And he'll sometimes be like, you're pretty, you're my best mom. Like he says the cutest stuff. And he goes, I love you, mom. And I'm gonna kick you in the nuts. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh. I need a new baby that doesn't talk. Um, but yeah, so if you ask him if he's a baby, he, he might do that or say that to you. But I was starting to feel Again, that desire, that itch for something new. And uh, so I brought it up with Chris, and I was like trying to sneak my way in like another baby. He's like, that's not possible. We took care of that. Um, <laughs> another business. He's like, you have enough that you need to do for this one. Um, a restaurant, like real estate, like all these things, all these ideas. And they're not bad. I'm not dissing any of those things. They're really good, but they can get out of priority for us, I think, sometimes, if we're not careful. And he, in his rational kindness, um, just said, maybe you're just called to be faithful with what's already been entrusted to you. Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. First, I was bothered, because I'm a wife. <laughs> and sometimes when our husbands have advice, it's not always the best timing, but... After I sat with that for a little bit, I realized there was some truth there that I needed to soak in, um, being faithful to what God has already entrusted me to and put on my plate. Um, and so I sat with it. I allowed that defensiveness to kind of simmer and realized it was probably conviction and um, decided I needed to go back to the one who is faithful, the, the source of faithfulness, the definition of faithfulness, which is our faithful father. Um, so I just want to pray real quick before we get into it, but Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to be here. I pray that anything that is heard, any transformation, anything from this Lord, that it is only because of you and your spirit. Thank you for an opportunity to always look back to you, to keep our eyes fixed on you, to be excited about the mission together as a family Thank you for pizza. Thank you for funny videos. All of it, Lord. We are here to lift your name high. Amen. Amen. Um, so as I'm diving into this word faithfulness over the last, I don't know, probably six months at this point, something like that, it's like, a new, it's like when you have a new car and everywhere you go, you see that car. It was like that. Faithfulness all of a sudden was just everywhere. I couldn't get away from it. I was like, how have I never looked at this in, in so much detail? And I just want to read um, a scripture on our faithful God. And there should be more scriptures in the handout if you have one. But in Deuteronomy 7, 9, it says, know therefore that the Lord your God is God, 
the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Cliff notes, if you haven't read the Bible, it's all about a faithful God pursuing his faithless people time and time and time again. And it's the good news of the gospel. It's, it's everything that we stand on. It's the foundation of our beliefs and our faith. Without his faithfulness, without his promises, without his promises being fulfilled, we would have no hope. Without Jesus coming and fulfilling what we knew was to come through Old Testament, we would have no hope for eternity. We would have nothing to hold to, nothing to cling to. And because he is faithful, because we have promises to stand on, um, we can look to him as the guide for that. We can look to him as the guide to why we would be compelled to live a life faithfully. Um, so just to recap the um, parable that was before us, um, we have the three servants, and um, each servant by their master is given different amounts of talents. And in this case, the talents are actually referring to a currency, but theologians will say that it can symbolize a lot of different things in your life, basically entrustments of some sort. Um, so they're given these entrustments, we'll call them talents, um, and it says that first servant receives, I believe, five, the second one, two, and the third one, one, different amounts according to their abilities. And we see that the master leaves and they are expected to essentially multiply. And the master comes back and settles accounts with them. And the, the third one, who only had the one talent, buried it. There was fear, laziness, potentially, um, some other things that we might talk about later, but doesn't do anything with what the master entrusted them to. And the first two servants multiply them. And this is what is said to the first two servants. Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. And when I read this, I was actually reading it through like a devotional study. I was like, oh, in the middle of that discontentment I was feeling, like that wanting something new, something bigger, something better. Um, God is asking us to be faithful. Like, that's it. Be faithful with what I give you. And I'll take care of the rest. So for each of you to just consider tonight, what is it that you're striving after? Is it well done, good, and talented? Is it well done, good, and buff, fit, skinny? <laughs> is it well done, good, and popular? Is it well done good and influential, successful, you name it. But I want each of us to really sit with this because this probably is driving us more than we realize in our decisions in life. And what the Father wants is well done, good and faithful servant. What he gives us is what we have, and we are to use that and steward that well. And so God, all throughout Scripture, calls us to different things in our life with him. And they're not always easy. Faithfulness, I would not mark as something easy. Um, but when he calls us to something, I want us to shift our minds a little bit and realize that because he is good, because he is faithful, because he is the author of all of these things, he is sovereign and in control. When he calls us to something, his created beings that he knows the best thing for, it's because he has good in it for you. He doesn't just need you to do something. In fact, he doesn't need you to do it to fulfill his purposes. But he has good plans in what he calls you to do. When he calls us to be faithful, he's like, I have good things for you in this. And I'm calling you to be faithful to me. Um, the first point that I noticed in this scripture is a life of faithfulness calls us to purpose. In, and then verse 15, it says, to one he gave five talents, to another two talents, to another one talent, depending on each one's ability. As Christians, and I imagine a lot of us, maybe all of us in the room are um, Jesus-following Christians, we talk about purpose all the time. We talk about what roles we get to play and all of those things, but essentially, every Jesus-following church and follower of Jesus has the same, the same purpose. We have the greatest commandments to love God, love people, 
We have the great commission to go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teach them his ways. And everything else is pretty much within that. So if you're ever like, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know what my calling is. If it's within that, like, you're probably okay. (laughs) Um, But because we do serve a God of abundance and a God who is always out giving, giving us more and more despite our... um, ability to deserve that. He gives us also unique gifts and unique capacities and capabilities. And it says in that verse, to one he gave five, to another two, another one, depending on each one's ability. It's such a blessing that we have so many different roles we get to play. But I think it's very important that we don't make those roles like the end goal or part of our identity. They're not part of our identity, they're part of a role and entrustment that we're given by the Father. So whatever you have, whatever entrustment you may have, gifting you may have, capacity, or capacity, that's a new one, <laughs> capacity, capability, um, whatever it is, Colossians 3, 23 through 24, whatever you do, like no matter what, if you don't even know what you're doing here today, <laughs> work heartily for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as a reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. But we do live in a fallen world, and it's wonderful and beautiful that we receive purpose, but the enemy is still prowling around hoping to distract us from that purpose. So that next point I have is the opposition, because there's always opposition until eternity, to having this God-given amazing purpose is comparison. Comparison is a thief, and comparison will steal our joy time and time again. It will lead us to bury our talents. It will lead us to feeling paralyzed, to feeling not enough, not good enough. It's never going to add to your life. Um, This isn't written in that parable, and I'm not trying to write into the text, but I do wonder about that third servant if you notice, he only got one talent. And I think at first glance, it seems like that's probably like the worst amount to get. (laughs) Um, And I don't know if he sat there and even knew what the other servants got. But if he did, if he knew the other one got five and two or whatever, like one feels pretty insignificant. One doesn't feel good enough. That's not the one I wanted. You don't trust me, God? And I think if we're not careful, what we're gonna do is bury the one thing that God gave us to do. So I love this quote from Sandra Stanley. Uh, Her book is The Comparison Trap. I highly recommend it if this is something that you struggle with. Whatever you have is less important than what you do with what you have. She goes on to say, celebrate what God has given others and leverage what God has given you. We are called to simply steward our entrustments. We don't get to call the shots on what those entrustments always look like, but we're called to show up to the purpose, to say yes to him. Because it says, the master said, you are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. So we, we know we can show up, we can say yes, and we can be expectant that the Lord is gonna use that. The next thing, um, a life of faithfulness. It calls us, this is a hard one for me, to wait on the Lord and lean in. (laughs) In the passage it says, after a long time, like I never wanna hear the words long time. After a long time, the master of those servants came to settle accounts. Faithfulness is long, it's the long game. It's, you can't check it off on my planner, like, It's the long game, it's longevity, it's loyalty, it's not speedy. And we have to be willing to hold tension for waiting in seasons that are hard for the Lord to do the work that he's wanting to do while also leaning in to what he wants to teach us in those times. The Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. Lamentations 3.24. Is the Lord your portion? And are you willing 
to wait for him in a season that feels long. In 2024, I feel like waiting just pretty much equals an opportunity to quit. We are really good at quitting. I'm good at quitting. Quitting is, it's easy. Our phones are just constantly telling us about the, the newest and the best and the greatest things out there. We feel like we're missing out. We don't have enough going for us. We weren't invited. All of these things that feel like, oh, I guess, I guess I'm not there yet. And so we're, we're stuck in this cycle of either waiting or quitting what we're already doing so we can have that next best thing. We cancel people. We cancel relationships. We quit on marriages. We quit our jobs. We quit our churches. And there is a season when I think there's a healthy goodbye to things. But I think often we, we skip that because things got hard. And so we decide to quit when God is still working in that season. I like this quote from, her name is Natalie Runyon in a book called Raised to Stay. She says, if we quit, like if we quit too early, we won't hear the song of redemption. We won't know the melody of restoration. We won't sing the song of reconciliation. I just want us to be reminded that there's a lot of holiness in waiting. There's a lot of holiness in what God has for us in seasons that feel really long. If we will lean in and be open to that and be ready for him to move. Because waiting is no thing for him. He's outside of time. But he has good things. He has pruning to be had, character to develop. Maybe it's someone else he's developing while you're waiting. You have to trust that he has good things in the waiting and in the timing. And I pray as a church that we could look different than the world. They, they, but also we, quit left and right. And why would they trust anything we have to say if we aren't standing strong? If we are wavering just as much as they are, why would they trust what we have to say here? So can we be a people that says, let's cancel that quitting culture And let's be stayers and remain when it's healthy, of course. James 1, 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Let that steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In the waiting, we have to remember that he is producing and inviting us for him to be our portion. The opposition to waiting on the Lord is doubting. And I want to be careful not to say that doubt is the enemy in and of itself. I think the enemy wants to use doubt in our lives to distract, to pull away from. But if we can just all be honest, can you raise your hand if you've ever had doubts in your faith? Maybe you have doubts right now, probably. Maybe you've always had doubts. I have struggled with doubt a lot. And I feel like it has been such a freeing thing to realize that doubt can be a gift if we let it. Doubt can throw us to the rock of our salvation if we let it. But sometimes we want the doubts to be the driver when we should be standing on the promises of God. Tim Mackey says, faith and doubt go hand in hand hand in hand. Spurgeon says, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me to the rock of ages. If we can be reminded today that doubt in and of itself is not the enemy. If you have doubts, you are just normal. The disciples were with Jesus face to face and they had doubts. (laughs) So we're doing okay. It's normal. But we can't allow it to be something that steers us. We need to know its proper placement. Um, I love this quote, and I actually can't find the author of it, but it was within the Bible app, um, a study within there. It said, we have to trust what our faith tells us and demand that our feelings take a back seat. It's been said that we often believe our doubts and doubt our beliefs. We need to flip that around. Remembering and claiming the truth we've learned in the rich spiritual seasons of our lives will carry us through the valleys when doubts come our way. 
when we are letting our feelings and our doubts shape us in our, in our faith, in our direction in life, it's just gonna waver every day. There's no solid rock there. We have to be reminded that it's not our feelings for him why he died on the cross. It's not because of our feelings for him, it's because of his feelings for us. Spurgeon says something along those and I couldn't find the quote. Um, the next one is a life of faithfulness. And the last one here, a life of faithfulness calls us to his joy and presence. The last part of that verse in 21, share your master's joy. The master gives an invitation to share in his joy. The end goal in faithfulness is not that we just get it all right and stick it out and muster up our own strength so that we're not quitters. The end goal of faithfulness is that we get Jesus. But spoiler alert, you get Jesus even if you're not faithful. The blood of Jesus is enough to cover all of those servants. If you say yes to his grace, you get his grace. If you say yes to Jesus, you get Jesus. And it can be so easy for us to try to make a, a list, to try to make a, a chart or a way or a ladder to experiencing his joy, but his presence was already bought for us at the cross. The opposition to experiencing his joy as followers, as people that have already said yes to Jesus, is just that we forget who he is. We simply forget who he is. Um, so like I said earlier, I'm a doer. A lot of you guys are doers in the room. If you're not, like, God bless you and teach me your ways. <laughs> but my dad is also a doer. And I believe I got a lot of that, well, from both, both of my parents, but in a lot of ways from my dad. And he loves to do things and start businesses, and he's been successful with that. And, I mean, he just started a school, and I don't even think he went to school. So <laughs> just keeps going. Love you, Dad. Um, but he's instilled a lot of things in me, and he's inspired me a lot over the years. Sometimes he challenges me, frustrates me maybe a little bit, um, but he sees potential in me that I don't see in myself, right? Because he's my dad, and he wants the best for me. But at the end of the day, my relationship with my dad, my standing as his daughter doesn't change no matter if I do those things that he wants me to do or not. It doesn't change if I fulfill the potential he thinks I have, if I exceed it, if I'm below it, if I say yes to any of it. It does not change that I'm his daughter and he's my dad and he loves me, that's it. And if we're not careful as Christians, we forget time and time again that our identity and our standing is in Jesus and him alone and his faithfulness. You could be any one of those servants at the end of your life and you're covered by the blood. We get to experience his joy. We get to experience being with him one day, not because of the life that we live. But I will say that God knows us the best that he sees your potential. He sees opportunities. He sees what he's entrusted to you. He doesn't want you to bury it. He wants you to step into it because he is a good father that has, has your ways written down. He knows what he's asking you to do and he just wants you to say yes. He has good things for us. He has good plans for us. The last song that we're gonna um, sing I love the line, it says, if I know my father, then I know my father has good plans for me. We don't step into faithfulness just to do another thing, there's enough to do. <laughs> we step in because we know our father. We know his faithfulness, we know he is good, he created us, his ways are higher, his love for us is like they said yesterday, irrational. It doesn't make sense. But we just get the opportunity to accept that 
to know he, who he is and step into what he has for us, living a life faithfully for him. You guys pray with me. Thank you so much, God, that you alone are faithful, that you alone pursue us no matter what we do or don't do, you are always pursuing your faithless children time and time again. Would you remind us that you are the source of faithfulness and that when we cling to you, when we cling to your promises, when you are the foundation, that we are invited into a life of overflow from that place. I pray one day, Lord, that when we get to heaven, you say to all of us, well done, good and faithful servant. But God, also thank you that when we're not faithful, you're still there welcoming us with your loving arms, accepting us and blessing us. Can we remember who you are and whose we are today and walk faithfully because of that? Amen.